Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Emulators. I think this is the second time I've done one of these since I've been back. Third stream so far. I'm really happy I'm doing this again, you guys. Um, today I thought we'd do something a little different. Uh, we've been working on the Libretro stuff for quite a while, and it's not that I don't want to work on that. Uh, it's more that I had some ideas about testing this timer stuff that's been bugging me for a really long time. Um... Now, I want to get into that, but before I do, uh, Dr. E-Man, uh, someone who's contributed to Rush Boy in the past, I believe, uh, made this really nice pull request uh, that totally speeds up the state saving in uh, in the Libretro stuff uh, by a lot, like a factor of like 20. <laughs> so I wanted to go over that before we do anything else. Um First of all, thanks to Dr. Eamon for, for submitting this pull request and also um, accepting the feedback that I had. It was mostly just small cleanup stuff because he did everything right. But uh, yeah, basically just want to go over this. The, the main things that he did, uh, it's actually two things. Um, if you look at the, the changes here. Uh, the first thing he does is normally when we were doing serialization, we would get a callback to report the size of our serialized data, and then we get another callback to actually dump the serialized data to a buffer. Um, and of course, uh, I was lazy, and I just implemented that as serializing it both times. So I would serialize it, and then just get the length of the serialized buffer. And then uh, when, it, when it asks us to fill the buffer, I would just serialize it again, because it'd be the same thing. So um, doesn't really matter. Um, but a nice little speed up would be to actually cache that. So the first change that he did caches that. Um, the only thing that's kind of annoying about doing this is is we have to clear that cache in a lot of cases. Um, the, the strategy used here is just to clear it on every other API call, basically. And I think that's okay. Um, I'm not too concerned about about that code. So so I think that's fine. But anyway, this, this is a really useful speed up because this already, you know, uh, speeds it up by like a factor of 2x. The other 10x... Um, comes from something a little bit more subtle that I actually had no idea about. And that's that, um, let me read this here because I actually didn't look into this uh, that deeply. Um, but basically uh, there are these boxes of U8s and this is used for like the ROM and the work RAM and all that kind of stuff um, when it's serializing our, our, versioned, uh, or our version serialized states. And the thing is, if you just use certa out of the box, uh, it will actually... Uh, serialize all these U8s individually instead of recognizing that this is a collection of U8s and serializing that together. Uh, and that's something that I didn't look at and I didn't really realize. Um, so apparently there's a serialized bytes function that, that certain encoders can use or certain cert or serializers can use, which is which totally solves this problem. Um, and in particular, bin code, which we're using uh, because we bin code the, the version state and then we uh, LZ4 encode that. Bin code actually implements that uh, really well, apparently. And so... But we, what we need to do is we need to mark these collections of U8s with this um, CERTA bytes um, annotation here. And that will actually make it use a serialized bytes function instead of serializing each of these U8s individually. So this is this is really nice because, um, yeah, I had no idea about this. Moveway00 says once specialization lands, it'll be automatic. I believe that's here, yeah. So yeah, I had no idea about that. That's really nice. And in addition to uh, annotating the types with that, he also went ahead and uh, there was one case where we have i8s instead of u8s, and that's I guess in the yeah mod data. So this is the um, uh, modulation data for the VSU here. Uh, and then this, he made a version of certain bytes for certain i bytes, which is just the signed ones. And I think that that's cool. Uh, so yeah, so he made a different version of this that also just uses that same stuff. A little bit of unsafe stuff here, but I think that's totally fine. Um, this is very simple code. And yeah. Anyway, I really like this. Um, so I've gone ahead and review... Uh, ex Sorry, I'm bad at talking right now. <laughs> oh, I didn't realize Moe Double Zero. I didn't realize that that was who you were. I probably knew that before, but I totally forgot. <laughs> Anyway, thanks a, thanks a bunch for this. Um, I already approved this earlier, but I wanted to go over that and merge it on the stream because I like doing that. So I'm going to do that first. By the way, how do you guys in the chat? I forgot to do that. Zockwar, Trilator, Dascon, G Superlin, Repnop, Chief Detector. 
<laughs> Way double zero again. Jira, Mad Moose. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thanksgiving is something I have not celebrated in too many years. And I miss it. It's really dumb because Thanksgiving did not make its way over here to Norway, but Black Friday did. <laughs> and the girlfriend that works in e-commerce is suffering about that, but we're all sympathetic to her. I'm sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I want to get into is I was thinking about timer stuff. And particularly, I don't know what made me, what made me think of, <laughs> thanks, Jira. That is not a question I'm answering. Um, solo is the situation. We're not going to say anything more about that. Anyway, um, somehow I ended up looking at this old thing here that I did last February or so. And what this is, is um, so so basically one of the bugs in the emulator uh, is that the timer seems to be firing at the wrong rate. It seems to be like there's, there's some certain conditions and I'm really not sure, um, sure what's going on here. But what we notice what, it, what this manifests as is if we play one of these songs that does sample playback via um, basically hammering the VSU registers, uh, like it basically waits for or uses the timer interrupt and whenever the timer fires, uh, it goes and sets like the volume of one of the VSU register or, or VSU voices. And basically the, the, the period of the timer ends up being the period of a sample. Um, so sort of indirectly we're measuring the accuracy of the timer with the audio output. Uh, but 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 what's weird is that in a lot of these games, um, in particular Galactic Pinball, um, we get a sample period that's not a multiple of one of the two available timer periods. And I'm really not sure why. So that's something I've wanted to look into for a long time. I've, I've actually looked at into this a couple times um, I have a couple branches here where I've just played around with some random stuff, and there was some discussion on here too. Uh, I think some of the stuff is actually correct um, that's on this branch, in particular the way that this zero status is updated. Um, but I'm not I'm not going to go too in-depth on how the timer currently works and how I think it's going to work, mostly because I don't have a lot of this context in my head anymore, but of course I will. But one of the things I always wanted to do is that when I was testing this, uh, I wrote this which based on this sample playback routine that we reverse engineered uh, in the debugger of Rustle Boy, um, I wrote a Rust routine, a ro piece of Rust code that if you give it an offset into this ROM, uh, it will actually dump the sample uh, based on the sample playback. And the nice thing is I could set the sample rate to a bunch of different things and I could sort of play with it, say, okay, if the sample period were this, then the sample rate would be this, and then this is what it would sound like. And I could kind of judge if this was faster or, um, faster or slower and then kind of adjust the the timer rate and stuff what i what i ended up finding is that the timer seems to be the timer period seems to be what it is in the documentation um and that adjusting that per period even though it fixes these these sample playback routines is not the right solution uh so something else is going is going haywire here and i'm not really sure what i do have some ideas though um what I'm what I'm generally thinking is that I, I reverse engineered a few of these different playback routines, and I think this is the only one that actually disables the timer and then re-enables it. And I'm wondering if the internal counters that that the timer uses get reset to some weird value or something whenever that happens. I'm not I'm really not sure, and there's it's kind of difficult to test this. But I did come up with a way that I could at least start testing this, and that's what made me excited about this again today. So what I actually want to do is that based on this information that we have here, I want to make a test ROM that all it does is play back one of these samples. Um, and I want to compare what that sounds like on the hardware and in the emulator, and they shouldn't match. They sh we should see the bug if I just do that. And this just better isolates at least the way that it's interacting with the timer. Um, I did, by the way, um, Jared says, do I have Virtual Boy hardware to test on? Yes, I do. Uh, I got the old Virtual Boy out. 
this bad boy and it has a flash cart and then i also did a bunch of stuff last november uh for rom reloading but i'm not going to be using that today um, because i didn't add interrupt support into the 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 loader that i have to that i communicate with over serial um Mubai says he's got three of them no i've got four of them <laughs> in various conditions and states of working <laughs> exactly bad moves Oh yeah, uh, I do want to point that out uh, with Mubo's changes. He said with the faster serialization, rewind seems to work reasonably. I haven't tested that myself, but I would love to. I will do that a little later, probably on one of the next streams. But yeah, thanks so much uh, again for that. Yeah, by one error, exactly. Um, but yeah, I basically want to re-implement this, this sample player and then have a ROM that only does that, just to further isolate that. An another, the other idea I actually came up with, because because here's basically the problem: um, we want to to do a bunch of tests against the timer to test its interval, and we want to do stuff. Um, we we want to test like, how do I explain this? We want to do a bunch of tests of like, seeing what the, how often the timer ticks, and when we don't disable and re-enable it or when we disable it and re-enable it, and like how long that first tick is versus how long the other ticks are. Um, and we need a way to, we need a way to judge what the real time is versus what the timer thinks it is essentially on the system. And we don't really have a reliable way to do that. Um, we could do cycle counting and then count uh, how many instructions we do. So we could have like a, like a wait loop that should take X cycles, um, which would be X amount of, or Y amount of real time. And then, we should be able to do that, but I don't really like that because I know for certain that the CPU implementation that we have in Rustle Boy isn't necessarily cycle accurate, especially with regards to cache, and that's another whole can of worms that I don't really want to touch. Um, but what I was thinking is that inspired by this sample playback, I actually realized um, another way that we could probably test this. So what I'm thinking is that and I, and I don't want to implement this today, but at some point I do want to look into this. I'm thinking we could, uh, since since the Virtual Boy plays custom waveforms, I'm thinking we could have just a ramp waveform, and we could set a voice to play that ramp like at the at the fastest possible rate that the that the audio unit can play. And what I'm thinking is that we could enable one of those voices and then disable it on the next timer tick, and then. Because we could see that ramp, we could see we could sort of use how many ramp cycles that it would go over as a way to tell how long it's been uh, from from when the timer tick started and stopped. So that would that would of course require some analysis, some some recording of of it playing uh, one of those voices on the hardware, and we need to do some analysis after that. But I think that might actually be a really good way to do it because I'm fairly certain that the timings that I have in the VSU are really correct and. I'm, I'm more confident that I'm going to be able to get that rock solid than I am about the CPU timing. So I'm thinking that might work. One of the, one of the issues with that, however, is that I don't think the voices restart their phase when you start playing a, a note. Um, but I don't actually think that would matter too much because if the ramp is set so that it will play at the fastest rate possible, um, then it, then we'll still see the same ramp. It'll just be shifted and we should be able to work with that. So I think, I think that might, might be smart. In fact, producing such a ROM might actually be easier than what I want to do here first. Memu says, can you replace one of the audio samples in a game with a ramp? And I, I, I don't think we need to do that because, uh, Yeah, I don't think we need to replace one of the audio samples with a ramp because I think we could construct that that setup actually a little bit simpler than doing the sample playback. But I like the sample playback approach just because it's very easy to see if it's like here if it's too fast or slow. So I just want to do some of the more obvious tests in that setup and also get used to um, actually writing test rooms for the timer. Uh, G Superman pointed out uh, it sounds like how a lot of console stuff was debugged on PAL NTSC. 
testing timings by checking which line to debug pixels on. Hey, Mr. Liquid. <laughs> nice. Yeah, that actually that actually gets me thinking, G Superland. Because I do think I do know that we can we can sync up enough to the raster at least. Where we can wait for a specific line and then change the background color and then wait for like another line and change the background color. Maybe that's actually an easier way to test this. At least to see some of the obvious stuff. I've also looked a lot into how the other emulators handle this, and as far as I can tell, like none of them are correct, which is really frustrating. Like Mendafin adjusts the timer rate and then has some some weird bug elsewhere. It's like it's like a combination of of changing the logic and adjusting the timer rate such that it ends up working out that these samples play back at the right rate, but it's totally not correct. Exactly, G Superlin. But I'm I'm wondering how this could work because in, in the in the virtual boy you have you have the drawing routine and then you have the display routine and the drawing routine is actually fills the well you know we could actually just write to the we could write to the frame buffers directly if we clear them to known values and then sync up to when the display is starting to display one of the known one of the frame buffers we know about and set the timer then and then when the timer's done hmm so what i what i would love to do inspired by those old school systems and let, let me let me draw this out with what i'm thinking classic paint so as a Thick boy. Good enough. <laughs> Hi, Nick. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> That's my brother, you guys. Nicholas M. Taylor. Follow him and stuff. He's way funnier than me. Hey, little bits. Glad he could make it. So if we have if we have the screen here, now let's assume we're not talking about the virtual boy here. In fact, I'll draw this bigger. Essentially, what happens is that the video hardware on a lot of these older systems um, is is basically reading the data that's going to display as uh, the screen scans down and sends out the video signal. Thank you so much for the sub, a little bit. Really appreciate it. Um, so as it's scanning out, it's reading the values in memory, and and in particular, it's also reading like different hardware registers. So one of the things you can do is like sync up to where the start of the screen is, for example, and like set the background color to a certain color. So you can sort of change it. Like let's say it was orange and you change it to red here. And then you do some event that you're waiting for. And when that event is finished, you change the background color back to a certain color. And what you get is all of the screen up until this point, including it looks something like this because this whole line above this would be red and all of this would be red including the line up until where this happened and then everything after that is going to be orange again and so for for large enough variance here you can actually uh, glean a lot from seeing when this stuff happens um, and i think i need to look at the timings of the different hardware to make to see if something like this is feasible but it might be and maybe that's an easier way to debug this. Is why I'm bringing it up. <laughs> it's super lit. Thanks for the thanks for the sub. Yeah, I forgot those are a thing too. Nah, classic paint works just fine. Classic 
Cletus Cole will, will Prince be available of this beautiful artwork? No. Hey, Dark Second. <laughs> Although I'd be happy if anyone else wanted to print this. Go for it. I'll waive the rights. Thanks for the bits, Mr. Liquid. <laughs> but yeah, the problem with, with this on the Virtual Boy is that... Uh, is that there is no, like, background color register that we can change like this. Um, thanks for the sub, Cletus Cole. Appreciate it. Yeah, there's no background register that, or background color register that we can change like this. However the LED brightness registers might actually work like this is what I'm thinking because then, then we can set the whole screen to be like a solid color and then turn the LED brightness on uh, when we know that the display procedure is going to begin. And then yeah, like set up the timer, fire off the timer. And then as soon as the timer interrupt happens, we can have that change. Um, change the LED brightness register to black, for example. And then just by judging the height of the red bar that we get, it at least gives us a way to visually compare something that's that's different there. It's not going to be super accurate, but it might be accurate enough is what I'm thinking. But I need to double check because I think like the timer intervals here... Uh, are 100 microseconds and 20 microseconds. And we don't have terribly accurate information about the display routine speed, I think. Maybe we do. I don't know. I might have to sit and let this stew for a bit, to be honest. But I kind of like that idea. And I don't know if it's something we'll be able to compare that accurately with the real hardware. Um, but I imagine that if it's, I mean, if a difference, if it's a difference between this and this, for example, we would be able to see that. Um, so I would need to do some math and see if this is viable, which I'm feeling a bit lazy right now and I don't want to do. My brain's not in that mode. So I think, I think for now, let's leave that in the back of my head, because right, I really like that idea. Just what you says he has a stupid idea. Would it be possible to move or change sprites to have the same effect as background? Uh, not really, because maybe I didn't. Uh, I don't think I explained this very well. Why this doesn't really work on the Virtual Boy? Uh, it's because uh, the Virtual Boy doesn't scan out the data like that. Um, it, there's, there's full frame buffers and the display part will scan out the data like that. So if you change any pixel data, uh, or change the LED brightness, you would get an effect like that. Um, but for example, sprites and all of the background data is not red. Like the data for that is not red as it's being displayed. There's a separate drawing, um, phase of the frame where it just populates the frame buffer, uh, the pixel data and the frame buffer with the data from the sprites and everything. And we have even less known information about uh, how long it takes to to or for the drawing routine to do its stuff. There's there's a lot of ways that I want to test that at some point. Uh, since I have the, the ROM reload stuff, I think that'd be really fun to test. But yeah, so maybe there's something to that, but I don't think that's the best approach necessarily. Yeah, no worries. I don't think I actually explained that very well, so not surprised that it was missed. But yeah, something's weird with this timer because the sample the sample rate that we get for this Galactic Pinball game, for example, um, for it to be the sample rate that it is uh, in the recordings and what we can hear from the hardware, uh, we basically need about two and a half timer ticks to occur between samples rather than the three ticks that we observe in Rustle Boy and the two ticks 
plus timer skew that we observe in Midnaffin. Actually, Luna Sorcery, there are some some of those kind of interrupts you can use, but it's more it's more like Ace Plank on the SNES where you where you set up tables that will actually change the values over time, and the drawing routine actually uses those. So at least for changing stuff per scan line, that's totally supported by the hardware. Um, it just doesn't work in quite the same way. This is a lot more 2D GPU-like in the sense that there's separate drawing and display circuitry. <clears throat> anyway, a lot of talking. What I wanted to do is I want to take this sample extraction code that I wrote and just have it run over the sample data and dump that as a binary. I want to produce a test ROM that we can run in the emulator and on the Virtual Boy that only plays back this sample. And then I want to adjust what we what we do to set the timer stuff with our own sample playback code. Dark Second, the hardware seems really cool. It's just a bad device. I totally agree. And I've really enjoyed making this emulator for that reason. I think this is a really fun piece of hardware. You can definitely tell, though, that it's a Game Boy V2 in a lot of ways. But yeah, before I dig into this, I'm going to take like a five-minute break, maybe less. So I'll see you guys in a sec.
And I'm back. So the irony, Mad Moose, is that the scene in OBS that I use when I go on break like that is called Potty Time. Excellent. <laughs> Wayne's World reference. <laughs> oh, man. Um, okay. So the nice thing is I wrote these lovely little notes, and here's even the data format. It looks like there's just this this data here where this is an OF, and then we dump this into the envelope data value. Shift left four for some reason. Otherwise, this sort of escapes this, and then this can go here, and then we dump in voice volume here and the envelope data here. And then this final one is the end of sample. Not a terrible format, and I guess it uses the um, envelope data to kind of shape the waveform too. I don't know how how well this like compresses or whatever, but it's a easy enough format to read at least. That's kind of the the important thing. Mister Liquid, I I meant to ask that on stream, but he didn't reply. That's kind of why I asked. I was fanboying a little. Oh, it looks like I actually just took the regions here anyway. So why don't I just dump that from the ROM? That's even easier. Then we'll get the binary. Yeah, this also, does this output to both of these? I mean, it shouldn't matter. Up envelope value here. No, it just does this one. Maybe I just read this wrong or something. I wonder what this other one here. I probably skipped a lot of stuff here. But I don't really care if we don't get this exactly correct either, because as long as it's something recognizable, then we have what we need. In fact, if I wanted to, I could even simplify the format just to make this even more pure, as it were, which is kind of what I'm doing for the sample export anyway, or the extraction. So I'm wondering, actually, because I do num channels here, and that's just one, isn't it? It's probably easiest to just output the samples directly. And then what I can do is I can change this playback so that instead of parsing this kind of data stream, it just reads out flat values that it dumps to the voice volume. Because I think that's the easiest way to do this is... is set the waveform data to just be all all DC and then change the voice volume over time. And we can do that with the samples that we extracted here. Indeed, you are, Molo. So I should have this code on my disk somewhere. 
See if I can find it. Um, I'm guessing it's called Sample Shiz or something. Because that's always how it goes. Doesn't really matter because I can just download it again. Yeah, screw it. I'll just write it again or build that again. Cargo new dash dash bin sample derp. That's how this is going to go. Uh, let's just take this. Save this. Oop. this actually print hello world it does at the end that's funny oh yeah i have all the stuff in the same place i have these these hard-coded paths in here that's kind of funny but i didn't move anything on my disk so this totally worked uh let's pull up this code here sample derp By the way, I'm totally listening to Rashad EB's cover of the Undertale soundtrack, as I often am, and it's still really awesome. Uh, Dark Second says, the timer speed in Rustle Boy just wrong, or are we missing some component? I, I'm guessing the latter, just based on what I've seen, because there are there are some things that use the timer for like extended period of times that, that we get right by emulating the correct intervals. I'm thinking there's some special cases with when the the timer either transitions from disabled to enabled or enabled to disabled states uh, where the internal counters get weird or something. I'm really not entirely sure. Um, anyway, uh, let me pause my music here and unmute that. Uh, I don't think it's Richard or Richard. I think it's like Rashad, like there's two A's in his case. Anyway, uh, so what I did here when I just run this is it takes that Galactic Pinball uh, ROM and it knows I found these couple samples when I would debug this the first time. And it just dumps this to a wave assuming that it's 20 kilohertz sample rate. And if we listen to that. We should. Welcome to Space World. Let's go. Welcome to space I don't know if you guys can hear how delightfully 90s this is, or if you can even hear it. Let me play this louder. Welcome to space world. Let's go. <laughs> so, I think this is this is correct. This sounds like roughly what it sounds like on the hardware, and that's what I wrote here. So it's not exactly twenty thousand, but. It's very close, but there's still some phasing, which uh, what I mean by phasing is that I took a recording from the actual hardware and I dumped this and I took them into Ableton and played them at the same time. And they're, if you can hear kind of a kind of combing sound that's very faint between those two, then they're very close in sample rate, but not quite equal. And that's, that's fine. This is as close as we need it to be because from this uh, 20 kilohertz sample rate, that's where I figured out uh what this rate should be because 20 20 20 kilohertz or about 20 kilohertz uh means a 50 microsecond sample period which is 2.5 times the 20 microsecond which is 20 microsecond is the the period of the small interval that the timer can be set to so that's why it's weird because because here we have a sample period that's two and a half times that um so i think something's fishy with the timer 
I did try to invert one, but again, the phases were not equal anyway, so you just get the two thing. You just hear the same thing twice with phasing. Um, but anyway, what we want to do is recreate exactly what this does, but again, a little simpler because I don't think we need to do the envelope data and the voice volume. I think we'll just get away with, with the voice volume. Maybe not. But the nice thing is we can iterate on this in the emulator. And what we should get is it'll sound wrong in the emulator, and then we put it on the device, and it'll sound correct. That's kind of ideally what we have here. And then we've at least isolated that, at least the purest form of this playback routine, um, which relies basically only on the timer and nothing else, um, fails in the way that we expect. Uh, so all I've done so far is I pulled up this VBDE thing again because I'm, I'm lazy when I'm coding C on this, and it has all the all the headers and everything that we need to do this. So I'll just build this in here. I don't really care. Um, and all I've done here is I just copied the last project I did in this editor and then set up this timer interrupt handler and it does nothing. And I think this may have crashed in Rustle Boy. Uh, and I, I don't know why yet. Uh, so we'll have to get to that. But I have a couple headers here. We also want this GCBB. So there's is there VSU here somewhere? Audio. That's fine. Yeah, so there's the voice memory. Sweet modulation time. We don't care about that. I think the SX RAM, because this stuff I think is... Yeah, this is for an initial register, and I think this specifies which one of these it reads from, if I remember this correctly. So it looks like we do sound regs indexed by one of these um, to set all of this stuff. And I thought, I thought there was like a global volume or something register too, but I guess not. It's actually easier for me to read in the Rustle Boy source. I don't quite remember this, but we can look at the mem map here. Yes, there's all the voice specific stuff and then all the waveform data. So I guess that's all there is, which is nice because then we only really have to, we can only deal with one voice. That's all we really need. So what I want to do first is I do remember one quirk with this and that's when we, whenever we touch the VSU waveform data, we need to make sure none of the voices are playing. Uh, I guess we get locked out if any of the voices are playing. Uh, so we do want to write to this. And I think we write that with a bit mask that says which voices to stop. If I remember correctly, it's called S stop, wasn't it? S stop like this. I went through and I renamed all the stuff to like the official register names, which is good. Yeah, so if that, if that, if that lowest bit is set, then we get this. So let's go ahead and do that first. I think honestly, even before we do this timer stuff, we could we should be able to get some some kind of awful sound out of this first, and then we can at least test that we're doing the the VSU stuff right. So I think I'd rather do that. We'll just ignore interrupts for now. So let's do this. I think we want to include some stuff. I don't know if we need to do that because this worked. So let's just try stuff here. Uh, stop. Here we want to. So this even dereferences the pointer. So we should just be able to do this is one. And I know that this is not the best time to run this, but I'm going to build this here anyway. Uh, just build like this. Building. Argument list too long. Yeah, this is something really dumb with this VBD thing that I've found. Uh, here. If we don't delete this release here periodically, 
there's something wrong with how it specifies paths and it ends up like recursively adding directories in that release directory. And eventually the argument or the, the path gets so long that Windows Windows breaks due to math, maximum path length restrictions. Um, okay, that's all we need to see is that OBJ copy at the end. And then we can run Rustle Boy with that ROM. And nothing really happens, which is good. That's what we expect. No crashes, but no sound or anything either. Perfectly fine. So we'll stop the VSU voices. Um, the, what I want to do for the initial test is just to write some noise into the waveform data and then play voice one with some stuff. Uh, and that will, that will just tell us that we're actually getting sound output. Um, so let's go ahead and do this into wave data one. And I think there's 32 positions here. Um, this map map will tell us data length. Is, okay. So there's 128 of these it's more than I remember, but that's fine. And then each of these waveform data, how is this interpreted? Okay. No, this is 128 bytes, but then each one, it looks like it's a full integer here. Is that what this is? So we have the adder over four. So maybe it's just, uh, Peace Nerex, thanks for the follow. I really need to set that stuff up for um, for subscribers. Anyway, I think what this gives us is word access to this to these individual elements in the buffer. So I think this would be 128, but this would be over four, um, which is going to be 32, just like I thought. So we want to write to the waveform data basically 32 units. And I think if we look at this, we should see... This is a uh, U8. That's a bit stupid, <laughs> uh, but that's fine. We could also just index this as U8s times four. Doesn't really matter though. Thanks for the sub, Malif. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, and it only looks at these lower five bits, and I think that that's that's unsigned value. So what we can do to make this real easy is we also this is c99 or whatever or c89 so i think we gotta do like int i up here or actually let's be lazy and make a scope i think that works or is it c99 i don't remember which one does this for i is zero i is less than 32 i plus plus and we'll do we have data one. I think what I want to do. We'll do this. I times four is. That'll give us something audible. And that's all I really care about so far. Is that built? If we do it in the scope like that, I think that should work. Yeah, that works. Uh, so that at least just fills up the wave data. We don't need these braces here. So then we want to just play this voice. And I think, I don't remember what we want to do for like the envelope and everything. I could pull up the the actual docs for this. Maybe I should do that. Okay, we definitely want to do this. Reg int write, and then we want to do we want to set this output enable. Yeah, there's also like the frequency. We should probably set that too. <laughs> and then there's the envelope and the envelope. So 
It's just easier for me to look at how this is used in the emulator code than actually read the docs sometimes. Yeah, the VB plays back sample data. Um, this just ticks all the clocks, and then the mixer should be down here. Get the output for sound. Really? Phase here. Output enable interval data. I think there's a I think there's a way to just have it hold the output forever. Which is ideally what we want to happen. I am actually gonna pull up the docs. But I'm not gonna pull up the text scroll, I'm gonna pull up something else, which unfortunately I shouldn't show. So you guys get a look at me looking at the docs. <laughs> Quality content. I need Jeopardy music for this. So we have these interval things, and we basically want to enable the output and have it output sound regardless of the intervals. And I don't remember what the intervals were. I think that was the that was basically to do the envelope stuff. Uh, yeah, because there's the int stuff here. Who's watching the watchers? Uh, output enable and then the yeah, the interval data here. Yeah, because if we don't output enable and interval data. Yeah, that should be whether or not it actually respects this or not. Interval data is this. So yeah, the duration clock thing here. Yeah, this will not disable this if we have the interval data to zero. So that's actually nice. Um so we should just be able to output hex 80 to this to the interval register. So place is uh, so it should be this one SXNT. So we want to do sound regs and we'll do index that with wave one. And I think because this is just the pointer here. We should be able to do sxint, for example, like this. No interval data. And what else do we need? We need LRV is the level stuff. And then we also have the frequencies stuff. And then the envelope specification stuff. And the RAM stuff. And I think we're probably gonna wanna set basically all of this stuff. Uh, I definitely wanna specify this RAM value. I think, not sound, no. default sound is the one we want. Is that what I called it? Standard sound. Uh, yeah, the RAM value here. 
It's just the value itself. Uh, so let's just specify zero for that. And that should give us we have data one. And then we're going to want to specify MRV. And for this, the MRV is the MRV reg. Okay, so this is just the levels for the left and the right, and it looks like these are just four bit values. So if we go to standard sound output, for example, or not, it reads the LRV stuff here. Here it is. Yeah, so it mixes those. Yeah. In fact, this is. Times this shift right three, so maybe it only uses three bits of this. I'll just double check this. Okay, now this is this is four bits. I guess this there's a baked shift in here, um, which is why it only shifts right by three. Probably shifts these right by three which would give us this scaled by this multiplied by two and then adds one for some bias. I don't really understand why. Um, but doesn't really matter. Um, maybe that's where this shift is. Either way, uh, we want to do FF here because we'll, we want this to be full volume on both channels. And then MRV. What was the other registers we need? Yeah, the frequency ones. So for this, I mean, this also isn't terribly important. Uh, we can do, for example, do this which will give us something and so if you're just going for something audible this should be fine and then the envelope stuff is the last thing remaining isn't it well there's a sweet modulation stuff i that should matter because we're not using that voice Fine. Okay, so what we want to do for the envelope is we want to set some bits here. That should, we want to specify the initial value for the ramp which is full volume we want to say the step time i think it's just going to be zero for everything else but d oh yeah there's two two settings here so this one should set the initial value for the envelope and the the ramp settings which are going to ignore or like the timing settings for the ramp and then EV1 should be we just want to disable the envelope Yeah, 
so just setting this to zero should be fine. And this should give us noise, I think. It's probably not going to be pleasant noise. You've been warned. I'll have my stuff on the ready here. In fact, I'm actually gonna mute this for you guys first. Oh, not bad. It's quiet. <laughs> but that's more or less what we expected, uh, just because it's something periodic. In fact, it, it sounds like a sawtooth, which is exactly what it is. Um, which should repeat twice if I look at this, because 32 and then I... This is the lower bits, so this should ramp from 0 to 15 twice. So this is definitely a sawtooth here. Uh, but that's great. Um, that means that this works. I'm going to just test this on the hardware really quick, because that's not a bad idea. Uh, we need to pad the ROM, though, and I don't remember how to do that here. I thought this had a tool for this. Maybe I made a tool for that. I don't remember. Let's look in the VBIDE directory. Or not VBID, I always call it that, but it's VBD. Tools ROM, pad VB, it's called. So, this desktop is something from desktopography, that's all I remember, to be honest. Really? D tools rom pad bb and so let's do this and then we'll do <laughs> what the hell apparently my virus threat detection is finding threats right now which is great timing um We'll do unpadded ROM, so that's users, Ferris, downloads, VT. and I think we're in samples of GCC, barebone, build, output.vb. And then, Does this work if I don't specify the size? If I just do automatic like this? And then the same thing again. Pad. Didn't seem to like that. A padding size in power of two. So let's just do this and then 2048 is 11. Let's just say it's larger than the output file and why is it not working? This is neat. Apparently we don't need the output ROM. Let's just try doing this with no specification. Yeah, that just worked. Okay, good enough. 
Um, apparently, I already have all the stuff plugged in. So, pull up Flash Boy. And find that again. I hate clicking through all these UIs, but at the same time, the stuff we're doing is easy enough that I just don't care. Output pad, so flash that. And we wait a second. Does it usually take that long to erase? I don't remember, I haven't done this in a while. This is why I did that reloading stuff. In fact, this part I could have done with with the ROM loader that I wrote last November. Man, that was a year ago. That's crazy. I was so fat then. So this should just hum on the hardware now. Good. Okay, so that works. The next thing we want to do is we actually want to modulate this with with something. What I, the first thing I'm going to do actually is uh, instead of outputting random data here, let's do Xerox 1F, which I think is the highest here. And what that should do is just give us DC. So the only thing that we should hear when we run this now is a little pop when it starts and a pop when it ends. Oh, whoops, that padded the binary. Pop. Pop, good. So that gives us exactly what we want. And I'm just gonna trust that that works on the real hardware because the last test worked. So then what we wanna do is we wanna set this, actually the level register uh, with the sample data over time. Now I'm thinking how much farther do I want to go today? Let's let's just try and get the data into the ROM first. Uh, if we just just to look at this, I'm just gonna pull up this output VB thing here. I wanna see what this looks like more or less. So not that much stuff around twelve fifty, there's nothing. Okay, there's actually a fair amount of random data in here with this libgccvb thing, probably fonts and whatnot. Kind of annoying. Debug screen. But at least we have, actually we do have like this whole unused section around 4,900 hex. So I wanna get the, actually we should see the ROM size increase when we, if the sample's large enough. So let's just try and get the sample in here uh, and not play it yet. Cause we, cause we need to set up the timer to do that. And we need to, yeah, lots of things we need to do still. But let's take that sample extraction thing here. Um, this guy. And instead of outputting so this decompresses the data, and I think all this does is where's it? Push the output here. Data byte. Yeah. So this just reads what it would have set for the envelope data. I think that's that was the approximation I did. Is I only cared about that, and that's perfectly fine. Um, and then, do I just output that directly? Do I don't even shift it or anything? Oh no, I shift it left by seven here. Why is that? Because the original probably nine by four five bits. So it probably gets a five bit value here. Uh, 
uh, no, Darks, I can remember that we're um, that we want to play the sample back using the timer, um, not using the actual sample playback capabilities of the of the hardware. So we want to get the actual sample data, the raw sample data, in a way that we'll read back in the ROM and then set to the um, voice volume register periodically, and that's what's actually going to give us the sample playback that we want to test. Uh, so where did I have this format documented again? Here. Yeah, the envelope data was this shift left four. And that just dumps straight to the envelope value. But we don't care about that. You know, I know that if we take this byte and we shift it left by seven, that should give us... Where was the format here? Wait for my PCM. That should be signed. I think if we look at the, I'm just gonna pull this up in Ableton to look at the data here. Cause I'm guessing it's all just DC. Or I mean not DC, uh, it's all unsigned the way that I just treat this. And then I get like half the available space here with these shifts, but that just does not matter at all. Uh, so if you just pull this up here, no, here, and this is, I don't know if this imports this entirely correctly. Yes, this is all above zero, you can see, and the, the values here are crap. Welcome to space world, let's go. And there's a lot of ringing because it's not exactly the right data that we want, but this is totally fine um, if we just played this back because it's completely recognizable. So... It seems to be using this this full range here too, which means that this is outputting 15-bit sample data. Uh, and so if we take 15 and then we don't do this shift here, so that means we have 8-bit sample data, which that should be more or less perfect. Um, we actually want 4-bit data out of this because I want to set this directly to the voice volume register. So if we take what we would have output here um, and we shift it right by 4, in fact, what we can actually do is we can, since we know we're gonna write this to the level volume here, and the level will set the left and right levels at the same time, we can actually just prepare full LRV values um, where we take the data that we would output, which is an 8-bit value, and we're gonna shift it right four, so we get a 4-bit value, and then duplicate that in the high and low parts of the, of the byte. Uh, so we're gonna dump a bunch of those. I think that's the best way to do this. So I'm just going to break this code because I don't care. Um, and I even do this. That's funny. We don't need any of this stuff. So let's just make this sample.bin. And then... I guess we could output the length at the beginning. Maybe that's convenient. I think I kind of want to do that. So num frames is the amount of samples. That makes perfect sense. So let's just take that. And we can write u32 with num frames. And that's going to be u size. We want u32, so we'll do that. And then we'll write the output. Yeah, I think this will this will work really well. So I'll put that, and then we'll have that many that many bytes. So we'll do right shift right four. So let volume is this. Let LRV is volume shift left four or volume, and then we'll write out the LRV like that. And that should be it, except this is a U16. We don't want to do that. We want to write this out as this. But, you know, let's just do this. Write all per byte is really stupid here, but I don't, I just don't care. 
that work? I think it does. Expect you to do 8 value 16. Yeah, because we have value 16 here, but we just want the U8s, which should be fine because decompress should be giving us effective U8s. And that should do it. I really don't need to remove these, but why not? And let's call this Space World, because that's fun. And if we dump this, uh, let's do, I thought I had another terminal open for that. I do. And then we get spaceworld.bin, which is 54K. And if we just look at some of this, we have our length in D800, uh, just to double check this. Being lazy here, D800 gives us 55296. And so 55300 should be our file size, and it is, so that lines up. And then all of these look more or less exactly like they should, and they, they kind of ramp up and down, so they actually look like a sample. Great, this looks perfect. So this is the data we're gonna play. Now I think the easiest way to get this into the ROM is to generate a header file. So actually, instead of outputting the bin, we should have just done that. <laughs> uh, but that's great, this is a nice sanity check, so it doesn't really matter. In fact, let's do this. Uh, let's get rid of this. And we don't need this. So let's do this, we'll do right, and I think we do, really? File, and then the, the formatting thing here, and we'll do num frames, I think we'll do, um, const u32 frames is this. I know we have the writer, that's fine. Do we even care about buffering this? I think we don't. <laughs> yeah, I really wish he had include bytes. I mean, really, if I had like a bin to OBJ tool, this would also work, but this is just easier. I don't really care. Let's make this right line as well. XXD, don't know what that is. Um, but we'll just hack this, it really doesn't matter. And also these, we're gonna just unwrap because we don't care. Uh, const u8. And don't we need to do this as well? Uh, the frames. I think here we need to do this too, just to escape those. I didn't realize that's actually cool. I wonder Nah, Pac-Man doesn't have it. Isn't that S S S? No. Oh well. I'm just gonna do it this this long way. Uh yeah, no frames should be this num frames. So just testing this really quick. It's actually including GIF for Windows. I'm not using that, but I'm using MSYS, so I probably don't have it. Anyway, I'm just, just gonna do this. Doesn't really matter too much to me. 
And I'm just going to dump this all in one line, too, because it really doesn't have to be pretty. Uh, so we can just do this. LV is that. And then we can do write file this. And we'll even do 0x to x LRV. Because then we're basically done already. Looks good enough to me. So now, if we output this to the spare bone thing, and then I can just massage it until it looks like how we want it to. So let's do. H that should build. Looks good. Yeah, so that's not bad at all. And in fact, if I want to be cheeky, I can do this too. Just for something to test. We probably won't hear much interesting here, but Oh, didn't like this. No, it's just file directory. This might be the path stuff again. Yeah, it is. That's so dumb. But it's not that bad. Okay, that looks good. And our output file is bigger. So we should basically see that raw data in here and we totally do. So this totally worked. And I just wanna run this for fun. <laughs> Perfect. That's exactly what we expected. So now if we adjust this over time, we should basically hear what we want to hear. I'm actually, just for fun, <laughs> this this is going to be stupid, you guys. Uh, This is probably going to be way too fast, but I'm just kind of curious <laughs> and having fun here. So I think this is okay. Good. So I'm surprised that we hear nothing. in another emulator we also hear nothing but i'm guessing that's just because this is way too fast let's do something like this static it's frame index which we initially set to zero and
Yeah, if there's anything that's going to make my life easier, it's Vim. Snicker. I actually don't mind Vim. I just think it's fun to make fun of that kind of thing. So I haven't set up this timer interrupt handler. I think this is what we want to do is set that vector to this. And then we want to set up the timer. I don't, I'm just going to do baby steps here. But this is, this is more or less what we want to do. I'm pretty sure. I really expected we'd hear like noise out of this though. So that's a bit concerning, but we'll continue. Another thing to consider is writing out, writing this stuff out to the envelope register instead of the, instead of the level register. So like if we do, Envelope zero is, or is it actually just this? Because we do frame shift left four. I'm just really curious about this. Okay, there we here are popping again. Anyway, I'm not sure. I'm just going to continue working towards towards actually setting this up correctly. So for now, we'll do the level register, which I assume will work, but we'll see. Uh, we need to actually set up the timer now. So... We have these. I was hoping we'd just get the timer registers. Let's see. Look at timer here. Maybe we do. Oh yeah, because we can just like write the timer control directly, for example. This isn't that bad. We can just use this API. I think this is fine. So we can do timer enable. And then I don't think we need to set it because it's the frequency that we really want to set here. Oh no, we we do want to because this is probably the reset values. And we also want to enable the timer interrupt. We want to set the int level to actually let this fire. Which, by the way. 
I want to do this before we do any of that, just to make sure no renegade interrupts happen. Thanks for the sub, Repnop. Really appreciate it. Yeah, Jack Skater, I totally agree. It's really annoying. It doesn't happen when I don't have to scale up the font to a stupid size like this, but I'd rather you guys see what I'm doing. Oh, that sounds annoying, Repnop. But I really appreciate it. Okay, so this doesn't crash, which is a good sign. That means that when we set the int level, nothing terrible happened. If we do this, let's just see if we get anything out of this. I haven't set most of the stuff we still need to set with the timer. Um, okay. Doesn't crash, but it doesn't do anything useful. Um, we really want to set the timer frequency. And I think we have this for this, the time microseconds. And I think <coughs> we wanted, we might actually just go for the actual register values here and not go through this stuff. But I think, I think we'll just divide by 20 over this. Cause we wanted, I don't know, let's just set like 200 here. Even though I think it's a thousand, which is what we actually want, but we won't actually get that. Just go through this for now. And then, oh no, that was timer set, I think that we do for that. And then the timer frequency is the timer 20 microseconds. So this would be timer set, whoops. that we have like get status and clear status which I don't think we need maybe we need that to acknowledge the interrupt though <laughs> But in that case, we can do like timer clear stat in the interrupt. Oops, that is not the right file for that. <laughs> Whole lot of nothing. <laughs> now the nice thing is we have an emulator here that we have the code for. So I can actually test some of this uh, just to make sure that we set stuff up right. For example, I can do, whenever we write to one of these LRV registers, we can do this. That. So it writes it once and then we never, that never writes it again. And what I can glean from that is that this interrupt handler isn't happening. I guess this should be setting this LRV value again. So. status 
Oh, did I not build it? That's quite possible. I, I don't think I should have needed to build it again. Doesn't really matter. Why is this stalling here now? Oh, I know why. Because I need to go here and then build it. That's annoying. Okay. And then we'll run it here again. Whoa! You guys hear that? That's a good sign. Um, I imagine the debug printing is slowing this down a lot. So let's get rid of this. Nope, that's legit what it sounds like. I'm guessing this is just playing back really slowly though. Uh, so now if we adjust some of this stuff. Um, we'll probably start getting something interesting. And yes, it's not loud. Um, we made a lot farther today than I suspected, so this is good. When I get this working, though, I think that'll that'll be it for today. And then this was a really good day. So let's actually look at this because I think That clears that. Also, I think there's some boundary condition too with the timer that we want to be aware of here, where Z stat for clearing this actually, this won't actually acknowledge the interrupt unless we disable the interrupt and then set Z stat. So I think we need to do. like this, something like that. I think that's what we want to do. I'm just going to run this again to see if we get something wildly different because it, it might also be that we're changing it too fast and we just, it just sounds weird. To me, though, it sounds like it's way too slow. So if we do something like this, oops. In fact, what did I what did I figure out was the actual microseconds? Yeah, it's a 50 microsecond period, and we had it at like a thousand. Um, I don't think we'll get 50 for this because that's not possible. And that's that's what we're planning to debug eventually. Can't have any endiness, endiness problems if all your samples are four bits. Uh, let's. Ha! It's a bit fast, but this totally works. Um, let's do. Do a sixty microsecond period. which should more or less match what we have in the emulator, but I'm not sure. Okay. 
Now comes some of the interesting stuff. So the sample playback appears to work. Uh, and the reason why I slowed it down like this. Listen to how fast that is. And then listen to how fast this is. Uh Welcome to Space World. Let's go. Welcome to Space World. Let's go. So that's that's the same speed that we get in the emulator when we when we explicitly ask for 60 microseconds. Now I'm going to test this on the hardware, and so so we we are targeting 50 eventually, but I want to see that this gives us exactly the same result on the hardware, and I expect that it will. So we're going to try that first. I just got to find that, and then. We'll do all the loady things. So what I suspect is this is either going to match exactly what we have in the emulator or it's going to play at the correct rate in which case then we've already isolated the issue i'm actually pretty pleased this was a bit easier than i expected to set all this up yeah enjoy my usb connection sounds So I'm getting nothing out of the hardware. Whoops. Not entirely sure why. Just to be sure, I'm going to flash this again. And I'm also going to do this. Okay, the padded ROM doesn't actually output anything. So this seems to match. <laughs> huh, that's annoying. I have no idea why that wouldn't work. But at least it's consistent. <laughs> so is there like, maybe, maybe it's the way that we read this sample. It expects it to be somewhere in memory that it isn't. And what does this do for like fonts? Gmap. 
maybe Adjustments. Like, what is just cons bite there? <laughs> yeah, I could try to remove the old padded file. That's worth a shot, actually. Considering that was the last test I did, wasn't it? Even though looking at the file dates, it looks like it matches, but let's just be be absolutely sure here. That works, and then the padded one, nothing. What? That's really ridiculous. Um. Well, okay, let's see. So right now I'm just using the defaults here. And I, I think, by the way, if we look at the padded one, I think it just repeats the ROM over and over again. No, there's a bunch of empty data here. Okay, this is stupid. Yeah, we have our sample data down here, but I'm guessing it's expected to be up at the top of ROM or at the top of top of the ROM up here. So we actually want to repeat this, not have a bunch of FFs here. So we do want to specify how this works then. So let's go ahead and pad VB. So we have this, and then we do let's do fill ROM with duplicates, and then padding size in power of two. Uh, okay, we'll just do 21, which is what it specifies, and then. Let's not specify the output. Uh, so that seems to have updated the file at least. And then, there we go, that works. Okay, so let's flash that again. So many things. But I'm enjoying this now. So this should play that sample on the hardware. And if it plays it, Slowly. Then that's interesting. If it plays it at the right rate, that's very interesting. Because then we've already isolated the issue. Whatever that may be. I just remembered I need new backup drives for my NAS for all these videos. That sucks. I think this is actually the most subscribers I've ever had at one time. That's pretty cool. Thanks again, guys. Really appreciate that. Turn this down because I think it's all the way up. Okay, so you guys probably can't hear that, but on the actual hardware, it's it's playing slowly like we expected, which is really good. Um, that's what we expected to happen. So, I think what do I want to test next? 
I think what I want to do is I want to just refactor this code a bit so that it more closely matches what the actual pinball code does. So we want to do the we want to write to these registers directly. Um, and then I want to see that there's a discrepancy between how it sounds in the actual emulator and how it sounds on the hardware. So yeah, I'm going to take a quick break and then I'll be right back. So I'm back already. Um, you guys that are <laughs> using the bathroom and stuff yourselves uh, aren't going to miss much here because I'm basically just going to start writing these registers exactly as they are. So the easiest way for me to do this is just to replace these individual um, calls here with writes to the registers that they write underneath. And so like the first one I'm going to do is this timer set thing here. And I think all that does is just sets these low and high registers. And we know which value we want from the reverse engineering stuff, which is going to be two and zero, uh, just represents two. And then, <laughs> sorry, Mullen. And then the frequency uh, we want to set to this. This is actually fine if I leave this as is, I think. Um, or actually, I think all that goes through the timer control. So let's let's instead of setting all of that, does all these Go through timer control, timer enable, timer frequency, and timer int. Yes, they all do. So let's do this. Let's set it to the exact value, uh, which I think is 0x19 in the reverse engineered stuff. Yeah, it is. Uh, so that's what we want to do. And then this is the sequence of events that happens here. So it disables this. In fact, where's the timer control? Yeah, it disables that and then re-enables it right away. So all we want to do then is up here, do exactly that same thing. Um, write 0 and 1, 9 into this register here. And then we'll do the update. And with all of this happening, we should get the, the sample playing slightly too slowly in Rustal, in Rustal Boy. And we're going to get it playing at the right rate on the hardware. I hope. And at that point, we have a test ROM where we've isolated the exact issue, at least relatively. So I'm just going to actually we'll do the padded thing now just to be sure. File date updated. Then we're going to run the padded one in Rush Boy.
that's fast. That didn't work at all. Um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. That's totally a dark second. There should be zero, not nine. I didn't. I didn't clear both digits. Good call. And now we got the stupid release thing here. <laughs> so that's what happens when we don't disable the timer. It just keeps going. It probably just asserts that interrupt over and over again without restarting the internal timer or the internal counters. Uh, so then we'll do the padding again and run this. Really? So that didn't do it either. That's strange. Definitely, Mr. Liquid. So I'm wondering if, if any of these timer functions did anything else. Doesn't look like it. I mean, there was this clear stat here. don't think that ever happens in the in the actual game though we can we can test this though because we can do this and we can just see what's being written here uh, as the actual game plays a sample just to be sure and we can do TLR and THR just to see if any of those change either. So this should at least give us a better idea what's going on here. Uh, so then we'll run the actual game. Here somewhere. lot of these so this does seem to do that alternating pattern like we expect uh, I'm actually gonna comment this out now because we know that that's what's happening there and I just want to make sure that we get these values right so we should see a right to TLR and THR right before the or right as, as the sample starts playing and then we probably don't see one until after So here again, the high was zero, the low was two. And the order in which that's written, I don't think should matter, but just so we match that might as well. THR and TLR like that. And I mean, this should be all we need. Which 
just to be sure, we can we can go ahead and set zero in this first, just to make sure we clear the state before we set it off. But I don't suspect this would matter. I'm gonna leave the leave this debug printing in here actually, just to make sure that that our ROM is doing the same thing. Build that. I'm not gonna run the padded one this time. I'm happy to hear it, Mr. Liquid. Okay, so this never writes the, this never writes zero to this, just writes 19. And I think I know why. If I recall correctly, uh, this is not properly specified as volatile. God, I hope that doesn't fix it. Really, there's a conflicting, oh yeah, it's here. I'm guessing a lot of you know why that's, why that matters. I also hope I specify that correctly. I could also OBJ dump this, um, but I think we're fine with this. Yeah, so that works now, which is really good. Uh, so let's remove the debug printing stuff. It's actually really bad that that standard library there, or that GCCVB thing, doesn't have that marked that way for this exact reason. Okay, so that's the, that's the slower voice again, and that should match what happens in the actual game. So I'm just going to play these side by side now. A lot of audio buffer glitches. But just ignore those, because I think this shows what we need it to. So go ahead and pad that, and just to be sure, I'll run the padded one again. We're looking good. Now it's time for the hardware test. Uh, as I'm flashing the ROM, I'll explain the ball file thing, but RepNop just explained it. Stupid. Yeah, so basically what happens here is we need, since since this is not an actual like array in memory, this is just a way to alias the, the, the actual hardware register pointers. And what happened here is that without these marked volatile, a compiler is going to look at this and say, okay, we set this value to zero and then we set it to 19. Well, an optimizing compiler can say, well, this looks redundant. Let's just get rid of that. Um, and that's because it, it's only looking at what the what the value of this is going to be after these statements run. Uh, the problem is that this isn't just some, lo some memory location. And so writing to this register might actually have side effects um, that are not visible to the compiler. Um, for, for example, they might, uh, in this case, it, it it makes the timer stop before we actually start it again. And the only, the only way that we can tell the compiler about those side effects is, um, is to tell it that the value, like if we write a value to this, we can't expect that that same value is going to be there again. And the way we do that is we mark it as volatile. Um, so that's the difference between a U8 pointer and a volatile U8 pointer. It's just that the, 
the the optimizer is not allowed to assume that values going into this are are going to to be the same. I think that's roughly how that ends up being. the The, the point is that all your registers should be volatile, <laughs> so that the optimizer doesn't remove redundant statements like this. Uh, okay, so now I'm going to test on the hardware. Okay, so this is very interesting because it plays at the correct rate on the hardware. Which is perfect. That's exactly what we wanted to see. Or here, rather. So that means we have a test ROM here that illustrates exactly that this timer interval may not be what it seems. Now, before I go, before I go, I do want to test one thing, uh, and that's, this is not the only sample playback routine that I reverse engineered when I was looking into this. Uh, I did a couple other ones, and let me just pull one up here. I did this one and this one. I did the one from Virtual Bowling, and I did the one from Red Alarm. Uh, all games that use very similar techniques to playback samples. And what's interesting with these other ones is, so here, this is actually a really good, this should actually be a really good test. Um, here, the main difference in this, in this T and E soft one, which is, which is the red alarm one, the main difference between this and then the pinball one is that instead of storing zero here, which will disable the timer, and then it'll be re-enabled with one nine, it's, it sets one five in here, which keeps the small interval and then the timer enabled, uh, but it clears the zero status and also disables and then re-enables the interrupt. Now, I think this is actually not what you're supposed to do. They, in the, in the docs, they claim that you should um, like disable interrupts or disable the timer and then set the zero status in another right to this register. But I want to try doing this, uh, one five and one nine instead of zero zero one nine. And if we get, what's going to be really interesting is once we do that, we should get the same result in the emulator that it, that it runs too slowly. But then on the hardware, we should also get that it runs too slowly, and that will tell us if something about disabling and then re-enabling the interrupt is what's causing the timing weirdness. Uh, we can also play around with these bits a little more to sort of zero in on the problem, but that's what I'm thinking currently. So let's go ahead and rebuild this. And while that's rebuilding, I'm just going to be, just to be damn sure, I'm going to put put in this debug printing again, and I got to delete that release directory again. Build this. Okay, and then we'll run this. Now again, this should still work, but it should still play the sound too slowly. To and it does. We have the correct registers being written. Uh, we'll go ahead and do the padding. I'm gonna run it again with the padded version, just to be sure. Looks good, and then we'll flash it to the to the hardware. If my if that ROM reload stuff that I built last year, if that supported interrupts, that would be so perfect for this. Because we could just we could flash it super fast. We wouldn't have to, to actually reflash the the cartridge every time. We could just send the new ROM over. Um, unfortunately, it does not. So we're we're stuck with this.
exciting times. But again, what we hope to see here. In fact, I'll just, I'll just disable this debug printing again. What we hope to see here is that on the hardware, this also plays slowly now. Okay, I didn't like to read that file, but it's fine. Moment of truth. Oh, okay. Yep, it plays slowly on the hardware now too. So there's something about the timer interval in that it changes when we go to a disabled to enabled transition or maybe an enabled to disabled transition or maybe it's one of the other bits. But the point is if we write zero, 00 here, it plays at the correct speed on the hardware, but not in the emulator. If we do 1.5 here, it plays at the same wrong speed in both the emulator and in the hardware. So that's very interesting, and that's very exciting because this is the exact test that I had in mind today, and it proves at least that we're able to isolate this issue, and this may be a good way to kind of debug this. There's a lot left to do with this, though, um, in terms of actually figuring out what's going on. <laughs> um, and that I'll have to think a lot more about. But I would consider this a success, a success and I've been streaming for long enough. So I'm going to head out. Um, thanks, guys, for hanging out, and I will see you next time.